like to call upon the phone. We're here. Great. <clears throat> Sorry, yeah, you're audible. Oh, okay. Excellent. Very good. Okay. Uh, Matt, I watched your video, and I'm going to attempt to win from OG, like an OG, starting with your first favorite move, accepting the trade-off. So I think the trade-off in this debate is quite clear. We want to weigh the risk of you never pursuing your dreams or achieving the maximum level of happiness against the benefits of pursuing more reasonable but maybe less rewarding things. We are happy to accept this weighing on intensity. We think that this doesn't matter if you don't know about the highest form of joy that you could ever achieve and think that the medium levels or lower levels of joy are all that you can achieve. This is fine because the perception that you are falling against goals is what makes you miserable. I, if you don't know something greater exists and you think that the happiness is this medium level, you are perfectly content with that. First thing on why desires haunt you. First piece of framing, the desires that are under 20% are probably things that you are never likely to achieve. Why is this? The first is that this is no pro probability based not on the effort you put in, so like causation, but based on things like randomness. So if you look at basic science experiments, right? When there is less than a 50% chance of causality, this means that the effort you put in or like the input, which is your labor or things like that, isn't really connected to the output. So even if you work very hard at this, it's unlikely that this has a meaningful effect on what you're able to achieve, which then means the 20% is based on things like randomness, based on like how likely a random agent is going to pick up your book, or someone's going to point to you like while you're walking in a mall and say you're a model, you're a star, which means that it's like very unlikely for you to be able to do anything towards them, and you probably perceive you have very little agency. But the second is that even if there is some level you can impact this, this Effort required is probably outsized the ability you are able to put in. So like maybe if you like were working really hard all the time, you would be able to achieve this goal. But in most instances, you aren't going to be able to put in that pers that effort or there's so much effort required that like you aren't likely to be able to ever achieve that. But the problem with this is that these irrational desires are also the most haunting and damaging to your happiness when they're not fulfilled. Because the things that you want irrationally are also the things that you are conditioned to dwell on the most. Why is this? The first is things like narrative where stories focus on exceptional things because one, stories are designed to give us hope. You focus on the exceptional cases so people can go to the movie theater or read a book and feel some sense of escapism and believe they too can be like, I don't know, like Meryl Streep when she opens her like cupcake bakery and is able to like survive in today's economy. Or it's things like exceptionality just being something that is very economical to focus on i.e it's a lot more interesting to focus on exceptional cases than it is to focus on your average joe which then means like this conflates to your ability to perceive happiness what i mean by this is people construct what they think happiness looks like based on the inputs they receive you don't necessarily know what it means to be happy you know you are happy when you've achieved certain markers or like when you achieve things that people tell you will make you happy as a scene when like movie characters start sobbing or laughing when they achieve their huge goals. You see that and you really want that because you think it will make you feel good. But the second reason it's irrational is because of the expectations and hopes that other people place on you that are outsized to your actual ability. So your friends and your family generally want you to also be exceptional because they don't know how hard it is to be you and they want to like be connected to someone who is great. So the people closest to you encourage you to go beyond and to be greater than you ever could be in ways that are really harmful because because this sets up expectations for you that is very difficult for you to perceive. They don't recognize you aren't able to achieve them or indoctrinate with you with these desires and you just dwell on them all the time because like within all of us is just the fundamental desire to be happy. If you think happiness is preconditioned on these sorts of exceptional things or unlikely things, these things haunt you for life. Why are people unable to ignore them then? The first is the contrast with reality. We live in a society where it's like you are expected to optimize everything. So if you believe that Op like the most optimization is like being a star and you tend to fixate on it because you want 
that sort of life as opposed to the life you live. And you make these comparisons to see if you're making progress. So when the point you want to be at is very different from your day-to-day -day reality, this tells you that you have failed to succeed or that you are not living the life you want, which triggers feelings of unhappiness because it because you have not achieved the like like criteria for happiness. But the second <clears throat> It's like the emotional pull to dwell on things that are pleasurable. It's just like really nice to think about yourself as being happy and to imagine this idealistic world. The problem with this imagination is like it's temporary. It's not true. And your pull to dwell on this just leads to later suffering when you realize this reality is not real. Um, why does this make people like miserable? I I think the firstly is just like the perception that there's no way you can really be happy because you can never achieve the requisites of happiness, i.e. ultimate wealth or ultimate fame, but also that you push this blame onto others. So when you are unable to realize these dreams, you blame the people that indoctrinated you with these desires. You feel resentful that your parents filled you with the want to be like the best doctor or the best career, but you have failed to live to their expectations. Or you do things like you push these desires onto other people. Like my mom is very upset that she never became a professional pianist. And because she was unable to realize her goals and unable to realize happiness, this debt gets passed onto your children who you expect exceptional things from and you curse them too to this type of misery. Um yeah, see you. When you fail people to people watch movies. Oh, oh sorry, you go Nas. When you fail to do something that has a 40% of ch chance of happening, presumably you still end up miserable. Yes, very good. I'm going to get onto this. What is the difference here? The first thing is you don't obsess over things that you are unlikely to achieve. I want to address this because I think this is a very smart point from CO. Desire is dichotomized. So you don't really have middle ground desires that are like 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 40 to 70%. The reason for this is you usually dwell on desires that are either proximate to you or things that are sensationalized. Um, it's really hard to conceptualize things in the middle because you think about things either as they are like proximate to you or about the end goal. So it's like easy for me to decide what I want to do tomorrow or what I want to achieve in a year and it's easy for me to think about what like my end like life goal is to be but it's hard to think about things in the middle because it requires a lot of projection into the future so most desires either are things that you are likely to achieve or things that you are quite unlikely to achieve just because it's very difficult for people to think about the middle ground <clears throat> but we think like this is fine like probably even if it's a marginal reduction this exclusion of the most impossible desires still provides some form of positive utility. I think this is a uh, important like margin in this debate. Um, the first thing I want to talk about quickly is that it's not as big of a gap in your expectations. So you select into things that are more rational and the weighing on intensity here is that satisfaction comes from the fulfillment of a goal and how much you believe you maximize happiness and the intensity of that happiness itself. I.e. if you see that you've like achieved the rational goals you feel as happy as you would have had you achieved the most like extreme goal out there but the second is you perceive a greater ability to, to succeed you feel like you have more power over your life we think this is quite good for most individuals great i think that speaker for that fine speech now leader of opposition here here okay can you hear me yep you're audible okay thanks uh, i prefer audible pois In opening opposition, we don't think people should be content with a life of mediocrity. We think aspiration is something that brings you hope and makes your life better. But we also just think that these goals are often rational for people to pursue. Okay, firstly, like what is the difference in scale here? So I want to pick up on the POI interaction that just happened, right? Note that there are many desires in life that aren't are like 30% likely. Like say you apply to a university that's competitive that has like a 30% acceptance rate, right? And you're probably still going to fail in that instance. They say, no, you don't have moderate goals, right? This is them trying to do an equivocation between objective and subjective probability here, right? You don't maybe think about it as being a middling amount of probability. But the point in this debate is objective probability. And many things you desire are actually just somewhere in that area area of objective probability and your subjective 
actually doesn't track that very well because it's very hard to work that out and we don't tend to think rationally in terms of pro probability very well. So actually there are just lots of things in life that you're going to still be pursuing on Gov's side that you probably are going to like to fail. And also the way that probability works is that you still even will fail sometimes when there is like a relatively high probability, right? So you're still going to have to deal with failure, et cetera, better. The difference is whether you have the more extreme like low, uh, low probability goals, which is good because they tend to be the most bringing of hope and aspiration, but also it just tends to make you somebody who is generally better at dealing with failure, but are able to, to move on in life and have a more optimistic outlook. I'll explain that in more depth in a second, but firstly, just really low hanging fruit about the fact that this is just bad, clearly bad in some key instances, right? Like some people live in a really shit life situation where there's probably like a 15% chance of them not having a shit life by pursuing a certain goal, right? And in very intuitively and obviously desire is heavily tied to motivation, right? You're not going to try to do something if you don't desire it. Say you live in poverty, and but you're relatively intelligent and you have the chance of maybe getting a medicine scholarship to a good university because of your degree but you need to work really hard you need to strive and it's still a, a low chance of success but if you fail yeah you'll have the short-term failure feeling but the biggest concern about your life right is probably that you're going to live in poverty and every other thing that you could do in life is probably going to be something that is not going to get you out of that situation every goal that is higher than 20 percent, right we think it's just good for those people because of the huge benefits it would bring to them personally of getting out of an objectively terrible situation where they're su suffering etc where they're, they're, they're unhappy where they're stressed over their over their financial situation except where they're destitute etc for them to not be there and i think even if you don't explicitly have a desire to be a doctor i don't think it's reasonable to, for them to suggest that like on either side of the house people can't recognize that being poverty is some, in poverty is something that is harming them i think that is just something that you have an, like an ability to tell through the fact that you like can't afford to eat you, you can barely afford to go to the doctor etc right these things are also particularly good for your community often. If, for example, if some people succeed, they might give back to their family, give back to their friends because of a sense of obligation or something. So collectively, this is very harmful. And finally, I think shooting for the stars will often help you reach the moon, right? Maybe you don't become a doctor, but this great motivation is more likely to mean that you end up working hard in school and just like getting a decent job. So at least you're a little bit happier, et cetera. If we buy that there are model middle ground success claims, which, op which Gov will claim, you're actually more likely to reach them with the motivation on our side. But let's just go explicitly to the trade-off and about aspiration, about an certainty versus intensity, right? And except even if the desires are not particularly good in themselves, you can achieve them, and if they're super unrealistic, et cetera, why are they good? I think the key thing is the sense of meaning and hope that you get from this, right? It's a long-term narrative that you can tell yourself that you're achieving something that is substantial, like you want to be a Hollywood actor or something. It makes you feel special. It makes you feel driven. It makes you think that when you're dealing with the monotony and difficulties of everyday life, there's something that keeps you going. And yes, you're going to deal with things like failure, but when you have this success mindset, you're more able to do that because you think that, that you can pick yourself up. They say no, you lose hope, etc. Firstly, even if you do feel like a failure, you at least think it's honorable that you tried and other people will relate to you in that same feeling and you'll be able to bond over that sense of catharsis with other people who have been in a similar situation. But also we think it's a positive narrative that you buy into because of motivated reasoning. Therefore, it's very easy for you to keep this narrative up even when you do fail. You're unlikely to actually lose hope and therefore resent your family, etc. right? Especially because people often have extremely malleable goals and they have a level of self-delusion, right? Like say they want to be a really good artist, but and it's really hard to objectively measure that. So they can convince themselves that they are, or they can be or they can be relatively successful, but reorient what their goal yeah. was and internally perceive it as having been succeeded, even if it wasn't as high as they initially thought. I think often people do get that satisfaction. But the key thing is to talk about the comparative. Because I mean, Gov tries to say this doesn't matter, right? Because on our side, people just don't want the good thing and therefore it doesn't matter, they don't get it. So yeah, admittedly, there is some negative harm that is not existing because of the change in psychology with Gov, right? Like you may feel not, you might not feel as bad because you didn't have this desire that you didn't meet. But it's very intuitive that you it's still a loss to your positive life, right? Like before I ate a cheeseburger, I didn't know that good taste and I wasn't like yearning for it exactly. But the fact that I now get to eat cheeseburgers, enjoy that pleasure is just a positive thing in my life. It's a unique benefit and something that is good and helps me to have, right? So this positive narrative is in itself something that matters. And even if you don't know and don't feel bad, you don't have it. It's still a loss of your relative yeah. utility. The implication of what OG is saying is that you should be content with a, just a level of satisfaction that is very minimal. But that is just assuming what they are supposed to prove. And I think it is very unintuitive. Take the example of, say, somebody who's a surf 
Oh, it, it, who like thinks, well, actually, you know, this is my place in the feudal system. I should, I should be meek and meager and I shouldn't strive for anything more. Or a housewife in the 50s thinking, you know, I, this is all that I should have. We wouldn't intuitively look at them and think that's good. That, that's, sad, that's a good way of living because they're happy with their condition. We would think there is something wrong, something tragic about them being in that mindset. Take CG if you have anything. Yeah, so the opposite to the hamburger thing works with sadness too. But the issue with this is that sadness compounds more and is more everlasting than happiness because it's a hedonic treadmill where it filters out. So that's why. Okay, well, note that if you're aiming for success, there's also a hedonic treadmill there, right? And maybe achieving your moderate goals is more likely, but you don't necessarily get a great deal of pleasure out of that. But like hedonic treadmill and just saying that it compounds is just buzzwords of debating, right? I can equally say that a sense of hope compounds, right? Because you, for example, you can be reminded in your narrative consistently as you try different things, as you pursue different paths, you can bond with others over the sense in which you get that. And it can be something that is, if you feel like it defines your identity and, 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 and continues throughout your life to give it consistent meaning. But as I, as I was saying, I think the reason that we have things like the, the na narratives in society, like Plato's cave, cave, like the experience machine, et cetera, is because we recognize that people can be unaware of what they're missing and still be missing something substantial, right? And that's even if it's not getting the great achievement that we think is often rational to pursue, just the sense of having something to aim towards is that objectively valuable thing that they are necessarily missing out on, on Gov's side. Many of the most vulnerable people in the world live in a shit situation. On our side, they have a, a chance of a real high success, or at least a, a, a way of dealing better with their life that is bad by having this sense of hope. Therefore, we weigh on the most vulnerable people being happy or objectively happy to oppose. Great, I think that that's speaker of that fine speech and I'll call the DPM here. here. Cool, I hope I'm audible. You're audible. Nice. Okay, I'll start in a sec. Desires are haunting, they're often heartbreaking, especially when they're the ones that you can never actualize, you never reach. So OO comes up here and gives us a very arrogant positioning as to how this is supposed to work. Maybe you can actualize career happiness or career fulfillment. So they never link this back to how you actually feel happy. From opening government, we tell you how people get a greater degree of baseline happiness and hence why we ought to prioritize this. We're going to firstly do some responses to opening opposition before rebuilding and re-emphasizing the crucial nature of our case and why it's debate winning. Opening opposition tells you that oftentimes this helps you reach a middle ground because it pushes you further and this is a good thing. I want to be very clear panel, you pursue this middle ground on either side of the house. That is to say, you want promotions in your job either way. You go after this and you chase after this due to, firstly, the fact that you want to improve things such as your living standards. You want to say that you've achieved career success and hence why you pursue this. But secondarily, out of pure necessity, people need to have a paycheck. They need to be able to feed their children. All of these things cumulatively mean that you go after this middle ground as hard as you can anyways. But the difference is, firstly, on our side of the house, you're more motivated due to the dopamine hits when you actually achieve things that are actualizable. That is to say, when you achieve the little milestones in your career that have a high probability of success, you feel happy, hence why you're motivated to keep on going and you're reassured in your choices. Versus on their side of the house, the goal is always so abstract, you never get that reassurance, you never get that push forward, that motivation. But secondarily, the difference is, even if you achieve this on both sides of the house, on opposition's world, it comes out at the huge emotional cost of never feeling like it's enough. You can reach the middle ground, but you'll never have the same degree of satisfaction of happiness with it because you'll always be stuck in the hedonic treadmill of wanting more, of wanting that 5% job, of wanting that 10% job. All of these things which will always make you you incredibly unhappy in where you are today, which as Emily tells you, not only affects your psyche, but also those around you and how you interact with day-to-day -day relationships. I want to posit this because I think opening opposition crucially fail in this debate when they never tie their points 
in any meaningful way to why it ought to be something that's 20% and below, why it ought to be something that is below this bracket. And I want to be very clear in characterizing this because I think what Emily tells you and what I want to build on is incredibly important in this debate. Oftentimes what we achieve and what is probable for our achievements, i.e. the stuff that's in the 30%, that's in the 40%, this is, these are things that a lot of people can go into, i.e. there's a high availability of spaces, for example, in higher management jobs, or for example, in having a family, or for example maybe renting a home all of these things there's a high availability of that means the access to these things is individualistic and determined by the individual in and of themselves that is to say how hard they work what they do the networking they pursue all of these things that they do have some degree of autonomy over and they, they can actualize therefore the desires that occur in this way necessarily are good when they're motivated by things such as the desire because if you do work harder you do have a chance of achieving it the under 20% is a death zone whereby it doesn't matter how hard you work, all the other people in that 20% and trying to get that 20% are working just as hard, maybe harder, maybe they're smarter. All of these things, but you have an accumulation of incredibly talented and smart and hardworking individuals pursuing these things. The difference becomes the luck factor. That's all the 20% is. Whether the algorithm picks up on your, for example, recipes online, or whether you're scouted in a certain job, or whether you're able to amend your family relationships, all of these things, it comes down to a huge degree of luck, of timing, of things outside of your control. That is where the 20% and below becomes lethal. That is where it becomes important. And that's why we resent the idea of chasing this and letting this haunt you and letting this dictate your life. Secondarily, they talk about this as a positive narrative. They say that this is something that inspires and invigorates and positive hope in people's lives. Once again, I'm left incredibly unclear as to why you need this to be so low. The probability of success being so high, necessarily meaning that the vast majority of people end up sad, disappointed, mad at themselves and those around them. They never explain this. You can actualize the same positive narrative with 30% of happiness. The difference is that you actually can achieve it and you actually can feel the tangibility of this happiness. I want to now do three main things. Firstly, I want to rebuild and weaponize why it's so heartbreaking with chasing the desires that don't manifest. Because oftentimes we're strung along mostly by the most irrational desires, by the ones that are so abstract that we can never actualize. Because one, there's a huge degree of romanticization about it, which makes them seem grander or greater than life. Secondarily, we posit ourselves for self-importance around this, i.e. the narrative that we might be the one, which is enforced through childhood, but also through the movies and the intrinsic desire of having a self-value in the world, which means we latch onto this and believe that maybe we can be the ones to do the things that we want to achieve maybe we'll be the ones that break through maybe we'll be the ones that can actually manage this and achieve this which creates an obsessive notion around this hence why it's always going to be on the more extreme end but it's also incredibly addictive it posits firstly incredibly toxic behaviors it's the idea that if I work hard enough, maybe I can achieve this. If I love harder, if I put more of myself in, if I'm more amendable, if I'm more agreeable, all of these things which compromise your individual integrity as a person, who you are to your core, and necessarily put you in compromising positions, mean that you necessarily accrue huge amounts of harm. The effort that you put in on opposition's world is insane to try to actualize these things. And even if you succeed, an emotional harm in the pursuit of this still occurs. That is to say, even if opposition locks all of their benefits for that one or two people that actualize their desires, they're still incredibly isolated. They're still incredibly sad. They still have the trauma of the things they've undergone and the things they've done to try to accumulate this. And yes, maybe one person can fix their relationship or deposit their job, but hundreds don't actualize this, if not more. On the counterfactual, you move on sooner. You find happiness elsewhere. You find satisfaction with the things that you conceptualize as happy. If you only are accustomed to pursuing the things that matter then that and the things that are probable in terms of success, you become narratively happy for this. We conceptualize happiness on the scale of relativity. That is to say, we believe that this is the peak of happiness because this is all we know. And in order to survive, we oftentimes posit this. But lastly, I'm just unclear as to why the desires that are so unlikely actually make people happy. That is to say, there is a trade-off that is too large that you only see in hindsight. I might have desired wealth, but the isolation that I did, that I had to commit for this, wouldn't be worth it. Maybe I thought it was worth it at the time, but once I'm sitting on my stacks of money alone, destitute, and sad because I don't have my family or friends around me, that's the point where you regret it. But secondarily, it's a huge degree of uncertainty on opposition side. That is to say, you don't know if this will actually make you happy. 
happy. A lot of these extreme desires are indoctrinated. For example, media tells you you desire heteronormative the relationship or a certain career. This is all incredibly speculative because you're not sure. There is a huge trade-off in terms of devotion to actualize this. On Do certainty, I? we demonstrate that more people are certain in actualizing their happiness. And secondarily, we demonstrate a crucial baseline happiness, which is incredibly important to people. I'm incredibly proud to propose. Great, I think that's speaker for that fine speech. Now I'd like to call up on the DLO to close top half here. Cool. Uh, I prefer audible POIs, but as I said, repeatedly, people often don't offer them. So if you want to put them in the chat, feel free. Uh, all I'm asking paths are probably they will unmute themselves. I'm sure they're very eager to. Mm -hmm. Cool. Recognize what a probability of 20% success actually means. It means if five people tried, one would actually succeed. If a probability was 5%, it means if one person, if 20 people tried, one person would succeed. The really interesting aspect of social dynamics is when one person succeeds, they often help other people succeed and the probability shifts. The intuition is this, the probability that the first female MP of any country was that first female MP was exceptionally low in the grand scheme of things. Nevertheless, when they became the MP, they opened doors to individuals, they set role model aspects, it objectively would have changed the probability because it would have made more people want to do this, which probably produced a collective mass for people to do this. What this means is that there's a breakthrough probability effect, as in maybe for one person it doesn't work, but that we should still want that person to do it because it changes the probability for everybody else so they can actually exceed the breakthrough. What I want to do is a few things. First, I just want to explain why success is low, uh, maybe the low probability, and why that probably means that dwelling on it and everything opening government talks about is actually instrumentally quite useful and probably is just the basic purpose of life. Recognize the reason success is low is because the thing that you're trying to achieve is something that a lot of people want to achieve, right? The reason that it's hard to get a job is because there are a lot of other people wanting to get that job because it's something that is seen as desirable, which means it's a competitive effect. I want to exemplify this in medical school ideas, i.e. if you're rich and well-connected, the probability that you get into a medical school is quite high. But the probability of you getting into that same medical school if you're poor and your family isn't a doctor is quite low. This doesn't obviously does not mean that that person should not try and strive to do that because of having flow on benefits to them, i.e. they try harder at work or school and there's all of the conditional probabilities for that to happen. But even if they fail, they still provide a degree of honor to themselves and an importance to their family and a role modeling aspect that gives them purpose. What does opening government say in response to this? Their strongest claim, which I'm going to deal with first, is the idea that you dwell on something uh, and then I'll deal with the motivation stuff in a second. Dwelling on something. I think when failure rates are higher, naturally you fail more, right? But failing more does not mean you become less resilient to failure. It becomes means you become more resilient to failure. The harder the failure, the more life forces you to be resilient to it. Therefore, the better adaptive you are to failure. This is a weighing metric, which means you should actually want people to fail more because they get better being resilient to failure. It also just means when you fail, and this is the reason why, when you fail, you're reflective over why you have failed. People push you to try to not fail in the future, i.e. you need to pick yourself up by your bootstraps or give you some instruments that make you helpful. So failure is actually instrumental for individuals. But as the probability that failing gets greater, it's probably not a linear effect, right? Like you, I, I agree with opening government that maybe the most lofty ambitions hurt more when you don't achieve them. But this is actually instrumentally valuable, right? Because there is a distinction between a desire for something and a utility for someone. For instance, a depressive has the desire never to leave the house, never to talk to anybody, but obviously that isn't a good thing for them, right? The distinction between desire and utility should be clear by that, by that intuition. So where does utility come from, right? Utility, therefore, must not just be about desire, but about something deeper, probably something about the enjoyment you have in your life, which is actually distinction from desire i.e. you pursue an action 90% of the time, like if you're pursuing debating, most of it is shit, apart from the 10% that maybe it is actually good. So it isn't actually even the way off of how much pleasure you have that makes life valuable. It's the fact of that 10% of pleasure that it has a greater intensity to do so. Why, therefore, are you better able to get that intensity? Intuitively, things that are, have a lower probability of success are things that are probably feel better to have because fewer, because many people want them and you're the person that has them. But also the instrumental reason I argued earlier, as in if you do it, more people get that. Perhaps as an individual, you want society to be more happy. But recognize also things like regret and persistence and you know, like the, all the linguistic stuff we get from DPM. It's probably quite good. 
Because what self-reflection does is it probably increases your sense of improvement or increases the sense that you are somebody who ought to be improved. This probably increases your motivation, which probably means it is quite important in order for you to persist in a goal that is worthy to do, not just for yourself, but for other individuals. Recognize that the ways in which you interpret your social life is not just completely by what happens in the world, right? It's not the case that there's someone who you can disconnect with, a white individual living in the rest of the world, if you're a Nigerian doctor, makes you feel motivated because you don't relate to that individual, right? So let's be specific to the community in terms of the success you're achieving and the signaling effect that that results in. What I think this does is it means as the failure rate gets higher, it probably means it makes happiness feel better because guess what? You went most of your life without happiness in, in the sense that you have to struggle for longer even though you achieve smaller goals. The response from DPM is, oh, you end up in a, a treadmill of um, small, a treadmill of depression or a treadmill of reject. Recognize that what you're weighing here is a, a dopamine treadmill on their side. You get loads of hits of dopamine very small, which means you're acclimatized very quickly. And therefore, you quickly realize that your amount of pleasure you get from small actions is diminished versus the idea of you get depressive treadmills, i.e. you have to you get rejected multiple times and therefore you don't ever feel it never feels better. The way you should weigh this up is twofold. One, I don't actually think depressive treadmills work the same way as hedonic treadmills, the analysis I talked about, i.e. the way you respond to depression is, not, sorry, the way they respond to not achieving things can be instrumentally valuable, but not achieving smaller actions is something that we as humanity and bio biologically sense doesn't actually improve as an instance. So there is a delta there in the ways in which you can make it effective. Uh, before I go on to way off motivation in a more specific granular sense, go on, Bart. Yeah, in your true Blairite fashion, would you agree with me that Liz Truss was delusional? <laughs> Yeah, Liz Truss was delusional and probably achieved what she wanted to do. Maybe it wasn't instrumentally beneficial for most individuals, but fortunately for probabilistic reasons, a lot of individuals do succeed, even though it can be good for them. I think the idea is like, what is the extension idea? Maybe it's like the probably, yeah, maybe maybe it's like some people should be harmful. That'd be interesting to weigh off. The reason I don't think this is important here is I think there's a lot more people that have micro successes, like becoming a doctor, having a nice family when they're told not to, being able to come out to their parents and actually having being accepted are all things that are probably instrumentally valuable insofar as the pursuit of a goal, even if it is not achieved, is still interesting in of itself. This is the last piece of it, which is the ability of the way in which you should understand success. And this is the intuition I'm going to leave you with, right? Let's say we both, and I think this is unlikely, but let's say we both win Euros, right? But the ability and the, how you feel about winning Euros would be very different if the probability was higher. Because if the probability was higher, that probably meant you have to put in maybe less work or you had to achieve less four pitfalls along the road because it means there was less incremental failure in getting to that instance, which probably means that feeling seems less important to you. It seems less unlikely to you because we always enjoy the successes we feel we've earned more than the successes we don't. If a probability is low, it's likely meaning that there's a lot of things along the fork of probability that could have went wrong for you Maybe you experience those in an amazing fashion, you're reconnected, which probably makes the success, even if it's equal, feel better to you. Uh, oh, oh. Great. I thank that speaker for that fine speech and all speakers on top half. It was a great debate so far. To open up back half, I'd like to call upon the member of government. You're here. I think all of top half needs to get a bit more jaded. I don't think people's hopes and desires after a certain amount of life actually matter to them. And in most people, in most places in the world, they recognize that they are something that's incredibly difficult uh, for them to achieve. I think for this debate matters isn't really in so much like inside people's what they actually want out of life stuff. It's mainly out of, firstly, risk avoidance for the people that cannot afford to take massive risks in the way that they're going to live their lives and fucking up for them and their communities. And secondly, structurally, people that are just objectively not going to be good at running things in society, running things in society and making things worse. Firstly, on poor people development and why psychologically and as people broadly go through their lives, this massively decreases the chance of them actually just ending up in really, really bad situations. And then secondly, going on to the political stuff. Most people in the world are in situations where they have some amount of other people depending on them. So they'd have family dependents, they probably have limited incomes, they probably have relatively fragile safety nets. This is like two thirds of people in developing countries and like a third of people in all developed countries. This is the vast majority of people. They also secondly, have a relatively low capacity for risk here. 
This means that there is a time trade-off for everything that they're doing. That means that they might need to work a job early. They might have other things that they need to do. They might have some other pressures on going to university because there's other people that need money in their family. They certainly can't go back to university if they fuck it up the first time or change courses or switch degrees or anything like that. There is a limit of the amount of time that they have and anything to do. This even looks as basic as things like what activities are you going to be doing outside of school because you don't have someone that can give you a lift there and you need to get the bus to this other community, etc. Secondly, they have capital trade Else. They can only invest so much money in the things that they're going to do. So this is literally things like the sports resources, whether they would pay to go to a debating competition or do something else with their money, whether they would buy textbooks for a certain subject, whether they get a tutor for one subject or they get a tutor for another. Like these are just very, very basic resources which limit the vast amount of what people do with their lives. I think broadly what this means is the choices that people make, particularly when they're young, are hugely limiting to what they are able to do in the future. The point here is if you avoid people even desiring to want to do the 20% of things that they're unlikely to, they are far more likely to make decisions which will then improve and development into the future, which looks like things like higher incomes for very, very poor people, which looks like people being able to just broadly improve and develop their social situations. How does this work from a very, very young age going forward? Firstly, in terms of early school, this looks like the choices of classes that they actually just go to. If they decide not to do physics because they understand that they're actually probably quite likely to fail physics because they're not not that good at math and do another subject and then they you know invest their time in that and also in school and extracurriculars they don't invest it in like debating because there's no value to them and they have no chance of success in that so they move on that then likely looks like they're more likely to develop positive outcomes that looks like they're just far far greater capacity to you know improve their grades actually get into university not invest their time doing a course at university that they were relatively likely to fail uh, to a significant extent and then you know actually end up fucked up and then they can't go back to university and then they end up doing something like becoming a cleaner and then ending up having loads of people that are just broadly in difficult situations as opposed to doing something like becoming a teacher for example this then kind of further and further builds i think this means that it develop likely positive outcomes for these people i would also note that success reinforces success i think particularly for people with very difficult backgrounds where they don't have anything like uh, i don't know anyone in the family has ever been to university or any notable academic or professional success any instance of failure is kind of just reinforcing a belief that you are people that cannot do this so actually the barrier for these people failing is a lot higher than what we're talking about in this debate here so i think you're avoiding a massive risk at the point at which these people aren't Aren't doing risks that they are just unable to do. I also think broadly this is just in massively increasing the likelihood of probably just most people in like poorer backgrounds uh, significantly improving the amount of money that they're able to make in their lives. This looks like a huge amount more people getting out of poverty and also just avoiding the worst situations where people's you know uh, best chances of being able to develop themselves out of poverty fuck up their lives where they end up doing things that are too hard for them that are too ambitious without any actual direction and they end up I don't know like drug addicts or like failing out or whatever. I'll take the POI from opening. Yeah, what this ensures is that in the long term, people will always be oppressed, right? Because you'll never have someone who will stand up to be a civil rights activist, stand up to be someone in their community who's successful, who can help them. The weighing here is straightforward. Some people fail, yes, but we get a better world and a more just world overall. No, I just don't think that's true, because I think really basically people are going to be wanting to do things like, you know, being a civil rights activist isn't a job that is like that's impossible for someone to do, especially someone smart enough. Like I'm talking about most people in the world here. I would just recognize that there are lots of incredibly smart people that would be very, very capable of this, where the probability would actually still be very, very high of them being able to do this job and do it relatively well. Like I'm, I'm talking about the median case here for most people. I'm not talking about like the exceptional circumstances which are just going to exist on both sides of the debate. And also I don't care about as much because meaningfully, this is a more positive impact for more people. I just want to deal with the kind of flow on benefits stuff that uh, opening opposition talk about here. Like, oh, you know, you can shoot for the stars and fall at the moon or whatever the fuck the phrase is. Um, I just think all of the trade-off stuff mainly deals with this, but I also, yeah, broadly, I just think all of the trade-off stuff mainly deals with that and wanted to flag that. I think for most people, this actually just looks like you can't do this. The paths in which you're likely going to end up in failure, the burden is so high for them to be able to achieve other things, it gets really, really difficult. I don't actually think this is something that's relatively realistic for them. Lastly, on Les Trust, 
Idiots end up in power when they pursue things that are unlikely to. Why is this likely? I think force of character is able to dominate even if it's unlikely. I think it's really attractive for people to pursue power even if it's unlikely for them to do so. I think there's also a correlation of competence with the likelihood of success for the, uh, these people. So there is generally going to be in the inverse situation where they don't do it, just far, far more likely to be competent people, which maybe looks like technocrats. And taking the opening opposition idea here, I'm just willing to trade this off, right? I'm just perfectly happy to say that maybe we get more boring leaders and maybe even we get less leaders from poorer backgrounds, but also the median person from a poorer background is less likely to be in absolute poverty and most people's lives are better. And also simultaneously, the idiots don't get to crash the economy like oh what do you do it's a bit of a shame that a few people don't get to become prime minister that's maybe symbolically a bit sad for some people but fundamentally more people's lives are better and it's not looking like things like not being able to like having to give up their homes because they can't afford to pay insurance because someone that doesn't understand economics has ended up prime minister and fucked up everything for everyone the scale of impact here in the real world is just vastly vastly different I think structural change to society is just much more important than what people actually want. Most people in the real world just are trying to get by day by day. Making that better for them is just better. I think for all of these reasons, quite obviously propose. I think that's the speaker for the hard speech. Now I'd like to call upon the CEO member speaker. Here, here. I want to observe a few things at the start. The first is that the probability of certain actions happening can increase over time, i.e. being poor in rural Texas means that you have a low chance of making a million dollars in your lifetime. But if you get into the Ivy League, the chance of you getting in making a million dollars rises significantly. But you never tried to get into the Ivy League in the first place if you didn't have the former desire of making a lot of money. The reason why this is distinct from OO is that they say, ah, like there's generally a low chance and you never try. But the point is that the probabilities over time can change if you engage in the lower hanging fruit actions that make these actions better. The reason why this is really important is that people don't take the actions that are likely to lead them to these outcomes. And therefore we think it is highly probable that some of these people can engage in these actions, but they never engage in the first steps to get there at all, which means that they are permanently stuck in worse positions than they could have at all. The second thing I want to note is that the thing, things that happen 10% of the time are incredibly common. That is to say, we take numerous actions in our day-to-day -day lives. They're compounded over every single day we live. The butterfly effect means that low probability things happen all the time. And if we take 10 independent actions that each have a 10% chance of happening, one of them will likely happen, which means that, geez, if you have 10 goals in your life and 10 of them are like and these are 10 goals that you have a low 10 percent chance of happening likely one of them will succeed and the success of that is likely to make you very happy the third thing i want to note is that probabilities are divided frequently between a large number of individuals for instance there's probably not any one individual that has a higher than a 20 percent chance of top speaking worlds maybe it's randomness involved within that process but we still think it's good for individuals to strive for these outcomes and if their individual chance of achieving them is low that is to say i Think the vast majority of actions we take in life probably don't have a 20 percent chance or higher of happening because the likelihood of random events occurring is just incredibly high in today's society which means that the burden on gov teams i think is significantly higher than oo would like to suggest i think in many instances there are tons of things that you ought do or ought try to do that have a very low chance of happening our first extension though is just a characterization extension i'm going to explain why you are likely to be able to analyze and understand when things have a moonshot chance of happening and mitigate your likelihood of feeling terrible misery when you fail. In today's world, when we have moonshot goals, we are usually aware that they are moonshots. No one buys a lottery ticket and then plans their life with the expectation that they will win the lottery. The reason why this is significant is that it mitigates the vast majority of gov ground. If you do not believe that you are likely that you stake so much on failure, it is actually probably the case that their offense is not significant in this round. Firstly, I think that there are frequently objectivist statistics regarding these sort of things. I mean, what percent of people succeeded in doing this thing? What percent college admissions rate you likely have? There are admissions calculators where you can plug in your SAT score and your GPA and see what sort of chance you are likely to have. Secondly, I think mentors, friends, and families keep you grounded about the likelihood of certain outcomes, i.e. you're not going to be told, ah, like you are always special, you are certainly always going to do it. I think people tell you, you're probably not going to get that job. Maybe you should still strive for it regardless, 
but they will remind you that you are not likely to engage in these outcomes in the first place. I don't think that any debate coach in the world would tell me that I have a 90, a 30% chance of winning worlds tomorrow. Thirdly, I think there are roadblocks to doing very, very low probability things. For instance, if you have a low probability of succeeding in engineering, universities just aren't going to accept you in the first place, which beats, I think, a significant amount of the first piece of CG's extension, because if you truly are likely to fail, I think there are roadblocks in place for this as well. Fourthly, I think you just see other people fail regarding the same action which means that you understand the outcomes are low and you do not believe that these are likely to happen. Second extension is about what happens to societal change. I want to note in their world, no one does anything under individual probability that has a less than 20% chance of happening. But if many people do things together, that probability increases drastically. And low probability things are often the most socially high impact things, which is a missing mech to identify, uh, to actually create the POI that C OO tries to go for in the CG speech. That is to say, first, if it was so easy to make the social impact that you want, then someone would have already done it. If it was easy to eliminate racism tomorrow, then people would have already done so. I think secondly, the forms of structural change that CG tries to point to are really, really difficult. It is really hard to imagine how you can change an entire system. It is really, really hard to imagine how you can make society broadly better. It is really hard to solve climate change. But these are things that people should still strive to do because these are, these are the sorts of social innovations that dramatically improve society. I think this goes for things like vaccines and ambitious medical research. You may only have a 10% chance of succeeding, but we should still have people going into these fields regardless because that improves people's lives dramatically. I think you create a huge collective action problem on their side because no one has the desire to engage in these things, to do things like pursue a startup that has a high probability of failing. No one is willing to take those risks because they never have that change. I think this also goes for political change, for instance. Legislation frequently has a low chance of advancing through parliament or congress but that doesn't mean that a bill that would be good for society shouldn't be stroven to get passed i think a lot of changes are difficult to advance and it's important to try and pursue them regardless i'll take a poi from opening or closing i don't really care yeah this debate probably assumes that the probability calculator is correct and aggregates your probability across life and presumably if your probability changes after university the calculator like takes that into account Yes, this doesn't answer the POI or the first piece of framing. That is to say, you would have never tried to get into an Ivy League if you didn't have the desire to earn a million dollars in the first place. So even if it is true that probabilities are conditional or aggregate, you only have that desire once you reach that condition. And given that you haven't yet reached that condition, that means that you don't have that probability. Say you have a 50% chance of getting into the Ivy League and from there a 50% chance or from there, like a 40% chance of being a millionaire. You never have that desire until you get there because the probability is 20%. I think this proves, therefore, that people are less likely to strive for things that are very much achievable for them, which means that on our side of the house, you just are, are much better able to get these things happening um, in ways that are not possible on yours. And I think they don't aggregate over society, which is this crucial piece of our second extension, if society as a whole no longer has broad desires to do these things because no individual has the desire to do certain actions, then you don't get things like startups. You don't solve things like climate change or have scientists working on these problems. You are much less likely to be able to abet pandemics when they occur because there are less people going into these fields, less people trying to create political change, less people trying to do these certain actions because the desire itself stems from the goals that you have. And if these goals are never probable, they are certain certainly much worse outcomes for for society as a whole. Proud to oppose. Great. I think that's Speaker of the Vine speech. CG Whip Speaker, the floor is yours. Here, here. Right, am I audible? Mm hmm Good. Uh, PY is in the chat. I'll take one from both in your position. <clears throat> Starting my speech in three, two, one. I want to first fill the framing gap from open government about why the reason that desires for vulnerable people are likely to be below the 20% threshold. I think it's important that the machine can tell if in your life you'll have a lack of information or the ability to capture information 
Unfortunately for poorer people, they are less likely to have informational access in their life to higher order desires, which means they're not likely to be able to access uh, these things in the first place, which is why the probability of this is likely to be below 20%. This is the framing required in opening government to prove this, and it mechanizes all of Joseph's claims about poorer people not being able to access those desires in the first place. The response to the POI, very, very simple. Nelson Mandela still is getting was still getting oppressed in apartheid South Africa, and he would have a 90% reading for him to break down the uh, apartheid. So this POI from opening opposition does not work. I think this is uh, particularly uh, important as well. The second thing on crashing the economy. Note that the desire to do this reduces significantly. For example, Liz Trust said, I want to reduce all tax and not have the Office of Budget Responsibility to check this. This will give her a, like a 0% reading that she's likely to win the next election or that it's going to actually go very, very well for her. Whereas civil servants and technocrats, as Joseph says, can check this and realise and hold them to account by actually having things which are like 1% chances. And actually civil servants will be retreated better, as Joseph says, on our side. This framing from closing opposition, uh, sorry, the framing of closing opposition of, from about low probability events amplifies closing government's case. Because if closing opposition is right, the low probability events can just happen, then it's more likely on their side for that Liz Trust candidate to work in the first place. Um, we're going on to closing opposition and taking them out briefly. Um, Open government gave the POI I wanted to give to closing opposition, but I want to respond to the closing opposition response about you manifesting that desire in the first place. Really intuitive example. Kids, when they're five years old, watch a superhero program and want to shoot magic out of their fingertips and stuff like that. But obviously they can't because that's impossible in this world. You can activate desires anyway, but obviously that, you know, you, like uh, without information, but obviously it's not going to happen. I don't think this is a, like a response that actually works in the first place, but also... I think they are just squirreling the motion and not taking the burden that they have to defend. This is just something that's objective. We just have to assume with massive fiat that this is just going to be correct every single time in the first place. But even if they can get away with this, it works really well in closing government's case because the first decision you make is likely to have massive path dependency effects, i.e. When, when you take the first job or you apply for something, if the probability changes as closing government says later down the line, you don't know what's going to happen. Therefore, from closing government, we prefer these people to be risk averse because those are the people that are likely to make most mistakes in the first place, therefore flipping the claim from closing opposition. Moving on to social impact uh, and stuff from closing opposition. Uh, unfortunately, they also have a collective action problem in closing opposition because climate change needs multiple actors to solve. But actually, they don't prove why people know each other's desired probabilities. You would need to know if someone else has a 90% probability to solve climate change as well. But second of all, the actor that may actually solve climate change may not even have the desire to fix climate change in the first place. Therefore, you might not actually get the benefits accruing from closing opposition in the first place. We are resilient from this claim because closing government's claim is that Liz Truss is one individual person who fucked over the economy and was able to be tyrannical in the way she did it. This is not a collective action problem claim from closing government, therefore we can sidestep this part. Going on to opening opposition and responding to them, but POI first. So some people are still going to fail at 30% poor people, right? But if you have breakthrough probabilities, people become the thought leaders and role models, that shifts the entire spectrum of success for the next poor generation, which means on scale, you actually get more people that are less likely to make this on our side in the next generation. That happens on our side anyway, because the people that are likely to have that success and be the role model and break through the glass ceiling will always have that percentage allocated to them in the first place. But also, regardless of this in opening opposition, we would prefer comparatively less people to make this decision anyway. It's a comparative game. So I think that we prove that there are lots of desires that are below 20% and they're more vulnerable. Moving on to opening opposition. Trivially, Joseph said that people should be more jaded. This is actually a good response to opening opposition because the issue with opening opposition is they don't prove why positivity is intrinsically the right mindset to have or objectively the right mindset to have. Being realistic is also a mindset people want. Being People actually being let down before, like for example, I would prefer to think that I'm not going to get something. Like I prefer to think I'm not going to get Copenhagen Euros DCA, probably won't, and think that that's fine. So I won't get upset later when I, if I think I did actually get it. And that's something that people all do all the fucking time. And I think that is a legitimate mindset to have in the first place. But also this is important because they have an unclear scale on resilience, right? Because William assumes that you have the perfect amount of information to have coping mechanisms, that you are able to have information like, for example, if you had a bad job allocation, you might get information from that that you, you maybe that why you did badly, right? So, and also, 
when you have a breakup with a partner, you have a lag in the self-reflection, all this sort of stuff. There are so many hoops to jump through in opening opposition to prove that you're likely to have resilience. But the path that leads resistance exists in closing government. I mean, people preference risk aversion, stability. These are biological mechanisms that Joseph's outlined in the top of his, uh, of his speech, which means we are more likely to be true and have higher certainty than opening opposition does. Then they say resilience to failure. The other way I want to do is the policy impacts, right? Because Liz Trust can fuck it over for everyone else. And that is worse, right? Because these individuals who might be resilient to failure in their best case in opening opposition will not be resilient to the fucking people who destroy their lives, make mortgage payments much higher. And she, uh, you know, what an idiot. Anyway, so I think this is just like you do harm massive vulnerable groups of people on their side in the first place. Ah, then Alice says, oh, well, you're doing buzzwords in the POI. Here's the analysis because I can't do it in 15 seconds. Sadness compounds more than happiness. And the reason this is true is that people find it hard to deal with trauma and they're less likely to be coping mechanisms to deal with that. Each event is a new harm, whereas success does taper off in the future because lots of people will not be able to reach the top and will get sad at every moment in the first place. But also most people experience more sadness and happiness because more things happen in life that are bad than there are, than there are good. So you face more setbacks as OO concedes, actually. So I don't need to prove that for, for them. Um, finally, on Plato's cave, um, honestly, maybe Jack Palmer likes this, but this is unintuitive for the average intelligent voter. The AIB does not think, oh, what if? Like, there's, no, there's, there's always veils of ignorance, right? They prefer biological instincts of familiarity and security. They don't prove that Plato's cave is something that people ought to believe, just that people can believe Plato's cave. So that is worse on their side. Against opening government, weighing against them for 45 seconds. Sorry, Jack Palmer, I do actually, I do appreciate you. Um, A couple of things here. One, we just have higher intensity of harm than opening government. We don't care if a lot of people in opening government don't are not able to reach their like maximum potential, because it's probably fine on either side of the house. But there are vulnerable groups of people who have the clearest delta and the least safety net that we should care about. But also in massive amounts of scale. There are more poorer people in this world. There are more policy implications of trust, trust's budget going badly, which cause massive investor damage, so investor flight and economic damage. But also we prove that there's massive path dependency effects where in the long term they're likely to be harmed more on our side. But also they don't prove the 20% margin. We prove where it's most impactful for the lack of information in the framing gap. For those reasons, closing governments going through this debate. But I think that's because of that fine speech and how to close this fine debate as a whole. I call upon the opposition over here, here.